Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'm working on brain-computer interfaces. I don't know how many of you have ever heard about this technology. It led us to acquire the electrical activity from the brain of a person in order to control whatever object or system just by the force of your thought. Well, this sounds a bit like uh, X-Men style. Maybe. <laughs> I think in the last ones they were having this. In the very last ones, they're just in the cinemas at the moment. But I need to tell you a little secret. Actually, it's not possible. Yes. <laughs> Everything that you're hearing, it's not really true if someone will tell you that you can control something with your brain. There are a lot of reasons. First of all, because the information that we are acquiring from the brain is really very noisy. It looks like this, and we cannot actually measure the activity of each neuron. It's not possible. We are having something like average activity of millions and millions neurons that are firing deep inside of our brain. So, actually, it's very hard to deal with this kind of information. What actually is possible and what is used uh, this technology for is only for people who are having something like motor disabilities. That is, when you, um, for example, cannot move, you cannot blink, you cannot uh, actually talk, nothing, but your brain still is working. So, for example, people can communicate just with this kind of technology. And this technology today is only reserved for them. But before going into the details of the applications, let's see how does it actually work. So first of all, we need to put a headset on your head to acquire the electrical activity. Usually we do it with the help of the EEG, electroencephalography. Maybe you have heard about it when you are actually passing by the hospital to do some tests. Then we need to classify and to identify your thoughts. It's not possible just to put a headset and say, oh, you are thinking about this, or you are thinking about that. No. It's something like a fingerprint. To know that I am, I am, we need something like a sample. The same here, because each thought is something that is unique for you and for you only. So we need to ask you to imagine something for some period of time, shorter or longer. For example, a hand movement, like this, or a feet movement, like little jumps, like this. And then the system will be able to classify these patterns among all the information that is deep inside of your head. And just after this stage, we can try to control an application. So these are the examples of the acquisition um, headsets we are using. One on the left is a high-density net. It's uh, used for the medical purposes or neurological research. One on the right is more for general public, and you can buy it right now uh, on the internet. So what actually can we measure? What information can we have? So first of all, uh, we can measure the states, the mental states of a, a person. For example, if a person is stressed, depressed, Excited. We can say all this information. In three or four states in the United States, it's actually even used uh, as a lie detector uh, for trials. In Europe, it's not used. It's not legal. We can measure something like intentions or errors. For example, if I would say, like, we just had lunch some time ago, and I would like coffee with milk. A phrase is normal. You do understand it. But what if I'd say, I would like a coffee with a cat. 400 milliseconds later, in the brain of all of you, there is a peak of activity called N400 that will be activated, that we can, can detect. N stands for negative, 400 stands for the duration. It's 400 milliseconds because the phrase that I just told, it's not correct. It doesn't exist any coffee with cats, dogs, or any other animals. Or, for example, I think the next example actually happened to maybe most of you. You are about to fill in the questionnaire, maybe during your exam, or some other test that you need to pass. And this is a questionnaire with multiple choices. 
and you're gonna um, pick up on the uh, answer A for question two, you are happy, you think this is the correct answer, and you move on to question three. And then you start thinking about question three, what will be the correct answer, and then at some point, you would realize that the correct answer for the question three, uh, question two, it was not A, but it was B. At this moment of time, there is another specific signal that will be appearing in the brain that we can acquire. And finally, when you're imagining something, for example, hand movement, feet movement, uh, tongue movement, when you're imagining the rotation of an object in your head, or if you're thinking or imagining uh, about any melody or any kind of an object, this is something we call action or active-based BCIs. This is the ultimate goal that most people call thought reading or really decrypting what's happening in the mind. So I have been working on one of the applications during my PhD. It's about a drone control piloting task. So I was proposing to control a real robot, a real drone, uh, by imagining a left-hand movement to make it go left, right-hand movement to make it go right, to imagine both feet or grass to make it land, to imagine a sky or a cloud to make it take off, and then you need to think about nothing in particular, being in resting state, to make it just moving forward. So here's one of the videos. Um, so we can see a user here, he's not moving and he's having a headset. And he's gonna control this drone just uh, with his brain signals. So now he just took it, make it took off, and now he needs to make it pass through the left ring. For this he needs to imagine left hand movement. Maybe he needs to imagine it continuously if he needs to continue turning it. Now he needs to think about nothing, and now he needs to think about right, so the drone can continue making its trajectory through the next stream. So, okay, uh, we can have the control of a drone, uh, but what if I would like to control something else, for example, a vacuum cleaner, that there are a lot of robots uh, in the form of vacu vacuum cleaners right now, or I don't have a drone, I actually don't like them, they're forbidden everywhere, uh, I have another robot, uh, can I do that? Or it's only for drone and we cannot do anything else? Well, of course we can do uh, anything else. Actually, we can control whatever a robot uh, just in the same way. For example, let's take another, dro another robot, it will be a droid from the Star Wars, a BB-8, I don't know if you have seen the last Star Wars, so there is a little droid that is moving. And the principle here is actually the same. I took this example because it's another experiment and this is a multiplayer, so there are two people are playing, trying to attract it and to pull it to, the side, to different sides of the table. The thing here is the same. You want to imagine left-hand movement, it will go left. You want to imagine right-hand movement, it will go right. We don't care that it is actually sliding and rolling and it's not flying. Actually, you can imagine a Yoda if you want to make it move forward, or making it towards you, or a stormtrooper, or you can imagine a cup of tea if you want, or your bicycle, or you can imagine right-hand movement to make it go left. We don't care, in the sense that the system is working in the sense that while during the training period you decided which action do you want to perform mentally, so later on the robot will perform this action in real world, that is it. You're actually not obliged even to tell me what you're going to imagine. You can discuss with me like uh, someone who's performing the experiment, but it's actually all up to you. Well, that sounds kind of... Um, uh, recreational usage applications, well, droids, drones, yeah, we can play with it, it would be a nice toy, but um, is it anything else? Yes, actually there is uh, a lot of other applications, but this time for real life use cases. That is, as I just said in the very beginning of the talk, for people who cannot move, for people who cannot talk, for people who can communicate just by the means of the brain. 
This is another application I developed in 2014 and 2015 in Grenoble in France. So this is the parts of one of the film about Stephen Hawking that was out um, one year ago, two years ago. We did the same thing. So it was a smart home control, and a, a person needs to imagine a door to make the door open, as you can see now on the video. Uh, you need to imagine a lamp to make the light turn on. You need to imagine a water kettle to start the water boiling for your tea or coffee. You need to imagine the TV to, to turn it on. Maybe you are not interested in this application because you have something like your TV command or you have actually a real application on your iPhone. You can click on the buttons, but some people, they cannot. This is the only means for them to communicate. So, it sounds like, okay, we have quite a few applications and seems working and seems developing, but what is next? What is actually that special about brain-computer interfaces? The most special about it is what we are using is brain. That is, you can forget your, you can forget your iPhone, you can forget the keys of your car, but the brain is always here, and it's even more that it is always here. It is working 24 per 7, analyz analyzing the information around you, meaning now some of you are listening to me, some of you are super bored and like, what she's talking about? I want the next speaker, oh, I want my coffee, oh, I want my Red Bull or something. The thing here is that uh, it's processing. Even if you don't want and uh, you, you actually make an effort to listen to something or, or you're, making, you're trying to pull your attention, it's going to process even in a consciousness, unconsciousness way. That is an interesting feature of the brain that would be interesting to you somehow to have the brain-computer interfaces to work in a more reliable way. That is uh, why I propose to you something we call priming. It's a psychological technique where we present uh, people with a stimulus prime in order to modify uh, the response to a latest stimulus probe. So what I'm talking about, if I'm going to say uh, fantastic, wonderful, great, awesome. And I will continue like this for five minutes, and then I will ask you whatever question I would like to ask you. Um, is there a probability that you're gonna use the words that I have used, or that you will answer me in a positive way, is very high. Because I actually primed you by using these positive words. Or for example, if you are, let's say, watching a TV, and you, s you are seeing a bottle of Coca-Cola there, and then some time later you are being thirsty and you will go to Walmart or to any other shop. And you are like, yeah, I need to buy something, I'm thirsty. Well, um, actually, a big chance that you will end up with Coca-Cola, because you have been primed with an image of Coca-Cola. Uh, some researchers call this a narrow marketing technique. I guess you're all exposed to it uh, during your day life. Well, what about to use it in some more scientific purposes? Let's say if you take uh, something like a first-person shooter game. They're very common nowadays. And here, let's make it work with BCI. For this, as I have just explained you in the beginning, and I guess you got it, we need to train the system to recognize some states uh, of uh, yours or some objects that you're going to imagine. But let's say if I'm not going to tell you explicitly, imagine this or imagine that. I'm going to just put a hazard on you and I'm going to tell you, OK, go ahead, play this game. OK, it's a first-person shooter game, so you start the game. Usually they are a bit dark, and so you sometimes need light there, and of course you need a weapon, of course. And you find yourself out in a dark corridor, and all of a sudden I will give you a flashlight. Because you're in a dark corridor and you need to move on, you need to continue the game, and you don't have any buttons, I didn't tell you about uh, any buttons that you can use, so I will give you a flashlight. And then, okay, you're kind of happy, it appeared by itself, cool, and you're gonna continue the game. And you will find yourself again in a dark corridor two or three minutes later. And you need a flashlight actually again. But now you're like standing and nothing is happening. What are you gonna think about? You're gonna think about a flashlight because you have just seen it. You just got it somehow. 
And if at this moment you will think about the flashlight, I will give it to you. Because just before, I have recorded your signals when you have been in the dark corridor, in the first dark corridor there, and I gave you the flashlight. So if you will rethink about it, and it will be natural, because you are in a need of this object, then you will get it. So uh, I made an experiment about this one as well, where one group of users I were playing a Doom 3, a first-person shooter game, and uh, one of the group were just doing a standard explicit BCI, at, as, where, uh, as they were told explicitly, imagine a flashlight or imagine a weapon in this case. But another group of users, players, they were having a, just a normal gameplay without any uh, aforementioned instructions. They just started playing, moving on into the game. And at some point, they, go, they found themselves in the dark corridor, and we gave them a flashlight. And then at some point later, uh, they would meet someone, like um, a hero, another hero, but actually it's not a hero, it's an enemy, that um, we need to protect ourselves from this enemy. So we will give you a weapon at this moment of time. Uh, so, no more enemies, but, so, okay, maybe we need a flashlight. No, there is another enemy going on, there is another zombie. So, you need a weapon again. And this is how you're going to continue playing. You are immersed in the game, you are in the continuous flow within the game. Nothing is interrupting you to play, and it is just with your thoughts. So, Okay, it has been several applications I have shown to you, and several examples I have given to you, but, um, what is it behind? So it's like, I have, oh, you're thinking now, she just told in the very beginning, it's not possible, but seems with all everything she's uh, showing, it's kind of okay. Well, no, because you still need to wear a headset, and it's not going to happen tomorrow that we will all be in the headsets, going through the cities, taking the metro. Uh, we need still to do a lot of the research, we need to better signal processing, we have a lot of issues to still understand better how the brain functions. So it will be all for tomorrow, maybe not even tomorrow, but a day after tomorrow. But what will be today is that you should remember, you already have it today. The force is just here, it's with all of you. You are already all X-Men and you don't need any science fiction books or any cinema to do it and to have it. Thank you for your attention.